Hi, I'm Bill Perkins. Welcome to Compass TV. If you love the Lord, love your Bible, and love to learn, you're going to love this presentation. The Bible says we're living in the church age, which began with the arrival of God's Holy Spirit after Jesus was crucified. The church age will end with the departure of the Holy Spirit, and those believers who are alive on the earth will also be removed with him, making way for God's seven-year horrific judgment on the earth. So this future mass removal of Christians, referred to as the rapture, is an obviously exciting subject. One special generation will not have to die, but rather be translated from this life to the next in a split second. We don't know when this will happen, but it may be closer than you think. One of America's top Bible teachers, Ed Heinsohn, will lay out seven stand up and yell reasons why believers alive today may be in that special group who will make one loud, exhilarating exit from this planet. Enjoy Seven Signs, Rapture is Close by Ed Heinsohn. Now, tonight, I want to talk to you about the signs of the times in which we live. Bill asked me to speak on uh, seven signs that indicate uh, the rapture may be close. Now, I realize uh, the older you are here tonight, the sooner you want Jesus to come because you're running out of time. I get that. Yeah, does it come in soon? I hope so. Uh, the younger you are, you're in no hurry for Jesus to come. My students at Liberty are always asking me, Jesus isn't going to come too soon, is He? Why? Well, because I'm not married yet. I don't want Him to come before I get married. Six months after they're married, they want to know, how soon is He coming? Boy, that changes. I like to remind everybody, a God who loves you enough to send His Son to the cross to die for your sins, loves you enough, He'll return when the time is right. Uh, plus, if we believe in a literal millennium to come, as well as all of eternity, we've got plenty of life ahead of us. In fact, more living ahead of you uh, than you have uh, behind you. So as we focus on this question tonight, I want to remind us there are often two extremes uh, that people take uh, in relation to Bible prophecy. And remind us again that prophecy is not written to scare us. Prophecy is written to prepare us, uh, to invite us come to Christ while there's hope, uh, while there's time. Uh, one extreme uh, is to run ahead of God and uh, start predicting uh, all kinds of dates and ideas uh, for the coming of Christ. Uh, you remember the Mayan calendar. Uh, you remember the billboards for Judgment Day in May of 2011. Uh, by the way, that wasn't even about the rapture. Uh, the person who put that up was an amillennialist who believed it was the return, uh, and it was all over, uh, etc. Uh, Jesus told us, Nobody knows the day or the hour of my coming. Uh, the idea is nobody knows the time, so don't waste your time trying to guess the time. Be ready all the time because Jesus could come when? Anytime, well-taught people. Uh, you've got that. You've got your feet on the earth, a job to do in the meantime, but an eye on the sky realizing I have to live in anticipation of the fact that He could come at any time. But some people want to run ahead of God and try to set dates for all of that when the Bible tells you don't do that. On the other hand, there are a lot of people who blind themselves to the obvious. I have a lot of friends in ministry who go around saying, I don't see any signs of the coming of Christ. I don't see any uh, indication uh, that we are getting uh, close to the end. Uh, they're like somebody who's so close to the trees they can't see the forest uh, after a while. So I want to suggest to you tonight seven things that I think the Bible emphasizes about the time of the end uh, and let you ask yourself the question, are we literally moving down through the tunnel of time, down through the halls of history toward the time of the end? Uh, Jesus uh, himself refers to signs uh, in a passage in the Gospel of Matthew, the 16th chapter. If you have your Bible with you, uh, you might turn to that passage. Matthew 16, uh, verse 1. And in this particular passage, uh, Jesus was talking about the signs of His first coming. 
over 100 prophecies in the Old Testament about the coming of Christ. Uh, and the uh, Sadducees and the Pharisees uh, had ganged up on him, so to speak, and challenged him, uh, saying to him, uh, if you really are the Messiah, if you really are the promised one, then show us a sign from heaven. Now that word sign in the Greek New Testament, Simeon means a miraculous sign. We've heard that you've done miracles, Jesus, in other places. Do one for us. Now maybe at some time in your life you thought, well, if I could ever really see a miracle, then I'd believe in God. But not necessarily. There were a lot of people who saw Jesus' miracles and believed, but there were a lot of people who saw Jesus' miracles and still did not believe. A miracle alone will not convert the heart. Only the power of the Spirit of God can do that, bringing us to a point of conviction, repentance, and faith. So Jesus said to them, uh, this is interesting, He answered, when it's evening, you say or predict it'll be fair weather today uh, because there's a bright red sunset, a clear sky. Or in the morning, uh, you say it'll be foul weather today, cloudy, rainy weather because the sky is red and lowering. You can discern the face of the sky, but you cannot discern the signs of the times. Now, if you like to mark things in your Bible, then you might underline that. Uh, in Matthew 16, uh, there in verse 3, the signs of the times. Jesus Himself uses that term. And He was indicting the religious leaders of His day, saying, you of all people, ought to know the prophecies. You of all people ought to know the times that we're living in back then. You missed the signs of the coming of the Messiah. Therefore, I'm not going to give you a sign. A wicked and adulterous generation seeks after a sign, and there will no sign be given to it except the sign of the prophet Jonah, and he left and departed. Now, that had to be a shocking day. No miracles today. Sorry, no magic show. I, I'm not going to do a miracle for you because that's not the real issue here. The real issue is your faith and confidence in me and in my message. But I will leave you with this, the sign of the prophet Jonah. Well, Jonah was that prophet in the Old Testament. They knew all about that. Who'd run away from God, ended up in the belly of the fish uh, for three days and three nights, prayed one of the greatest prayers in the Old Testament, like, help, I'm going to die. Uh, and the fish spit him up on the shore, and he decided, yeah, I could try doing this. Uh, and after three days and three nights, came back, in essence, alive. And Jesus was saying, the sign of the prophet Jonah will be this, when I return to life after three days and three nights. If my resurrection, ultimately, does not convince you that is the ultimate miracle. Nothing else will. That's why the resurrection is so vital that we understand it. That it's real. That it's literal. That Jesus did not just ooze out of the grave, but stood up and walked out in a resurrected, glorified, but real body. A body where He could say to the disciples, touch me and see that I'm real. Uh, Thomas, put your finger in the nail print and be not faithless but believing. Somebody asked me once, do you think there will be anything man-made in heaven? I thought about that for a moment, and I said, yes, if nothing else, the nail prints in Jesus' hands and feet. For after the resurrection, in a resurrected, glorified body, He still had the nail prints that will shout to us for all eternity, I love you, I love you, I love you, I did it all for you. But they had missed the signs of the first coming. Later in Jesus' ministry, He comes down to the final week. He's about to go to the cross. Uh, and in Luke chapter 21, He talks about the signs of His second coming, of His return. In Luke 21, beginning at verse 25, Jesus said, And there will be 
signs, there's that word again, you might circle it, in the sun and the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring like a tsunami, men's hearts failing them for fear for those things that are coming on the earth. Why? For the powers of heaven shall be shaken, and then they shall see the Son of Man coming in the cloud with power and great glory. Now that's not the rapture. At the rapture, the archangel shouts, the trumpet sounds, the dead in Christ are raised, and we that are alive and remain are caught up into the presence of God. Fosh, you're out of here. Uh, the Greek word is harpazo, snatched away, caught away. Even those who disagree with the timing of the rapture must admit there will be a rapture. There has to be a time when the dead are raised and the living are caught up. You can put it before the tribulation, during the tribulation, after the tribulation. You can suggest there is no tribulation. The whole church age is tribulation. You can put it before the millennium, after the millennium. There is no millennium. The whole church age is the millennium. Or you can put it at the end of time. But you have to put it somewhere. Sadly, a lot of people who don't believe in a pre-tribulational rapture go around saying, oh, there never will be a rapture. No, there has to be. There has to be a time when the dead are raised and those that are alive and remain under the coming of Christ are caught up. But the signs that Jesus is referring to in this passage are when He is returning in judgment at the end. And then He says in verse 28, when these things begin to come to pass, then look up, lift up your heads, for your redemption draws nigh or near. In other words, when you think you begin to see some of these things happening, you better start keeping an eye on the sky. You better be watching for me to come. And he'll say over and over, and anytime he talks about his return, keep watching, be waiting, pray that you escape uh, the hour of trial that is coming upon the whole world, uh, etc. Now, if the signs refer to the return, and if indeed the rapture is before the return, then if we begin to see some of the signs of the return, that ought to tell us the rapture is even coming what? Sooner. If you went to the mall right now, uh, and they're already putting up Christmas decorations uh, in some shopping areas, and you saw the signs of Christmas, here in America you would know not only is Christmas coming soon, but what holiday is coming even sooner? Thanksgiving. Uh, forget Halloween, uh, Thanksgiving uh, is coming even sooner. I see the signs of Christmas. That tells me all these holidays are beginning to come. So that's the idea here. Now, I want to suggest to you tonight seven things on the horizon of the human experience right now that tell us God is at least setting the stage for the time of the end. Nobody can tell you how much time is left. And please don't fall for people trying to do that. Don't be confused or deceived by people on radio, television, or in a book uh, trying to tell you they know when Jesus is coming back. No, they don't. I've been in the ministry for 50 years, so I've heard it all. Uh, 1972, 75, let's see, 1988, uh, 92, 2000, uh, whatever. Uh, if Jesus died on the cross in 20, excuse me, in 30 A.D. or 33, depending on which chronology you follow, somebody sooner or later write a book suggesting, well, it's not been 2,000 years since he died on the cross yet, so maybe that's when he's going to come back. There's going to be every kind of wild-eyed speculation. The facts of prophecy are clear. The interpretations are often a matter of debate. Beyond that, everything else is pure speculation. My dear friend Tim LaHaye, now with the Lord, Tim used to say, but when the rapture comes, all your clothes are going to fall off as a testimony to the fact that you've been raptured and they've been left behind. So I like to ask him, Tim, what about your glasses? What about false teeth, fillings, artificial parts? Some of us would have more left behind than God. <laughs> yeah, there's Grandma. Man, she left a pile. None of that was real. I don't know. There's some things we won't know till it happens. 
But some things I think are pretty clear. Let me suggest to you five, I'm going to expand it tonight to seven signs of the end. Number one, the rebirth of the nation of Israel ought to get our attention. The fact that Israel is back in the promised land after being gone for almost 1,900 years, that ought to get our attention. Uh, That's like a flashing light on the prophetic horizon saying, hello, wake up. Now think of this for a moment. When the Romans marched into Jerusalem in 70 A.D., destroyed the city and destroyed the temple in fulfillment of Jesus' prophecy, every stone will be thrown down, etc., Uh, They literally destroyed the place, changed the name of the country to Palestine, which is Latin, Palestina, for Philistines, uh, the very enemies of Israel in the Old Testament. They gave it the worst possible name that you could have ever come up with at that time to obliterate the memory of Israel. And the Jewish people were slaughtered and scattered all over the world. And for almost 1,900 years, there was no Israel on a map. If you were to pick up an ancient Roman map, at that part of the world, it would have said Palestine. If you picked up a map in the Middle Ages, it would have said the same thing, right into the 19th century. But in May of 1948, when the people of Israel declared their independence, that nation came back into existence after all those centuries. That has never happened in history, not to any country that has lost their nation, lost their land, been scattered, and reborn physically back in that land. The prophet Isaiah looked down through the tunnel of time, down into the distant future, and he made this prediction in Isaiah 66, verse 8, who has heard of such a thing, who has seen such things, shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day? Or shall a nation be born at once? For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Both Christian theologians and Jewish rabbis agree that that prophecy was fulfilled at the time Israel was reborn as a nation. Now, whether that happened in 1948 or 67 when they conquered Jerusalem or yet, God knows all that. But I would remind us tonight, there are only 14 million Jews in the world. That's all. A tiny little element of people that have made an incredible impact on this world. Half of them live in Israel today. Seven million of them are in Israel. Some people will say, but Ed, they're there in unbelief. Uh, Most of them don't believe that Jesus really is Hamashiach, the Messiah. But many of them do now. Uh, When I first went to Israel 30 years ago, it was estimated there were about 5,000 born-again Messianic Jews in Israel. Today, the estimate is about 25,000. I had the privilege of uh, speaking last April in the oldest Messianic assembly in Jerusalem, 200 people. They have been preaching the gospel to the Jewish people for over 100 years. Uh, An amazing group of people. Tim Lay and I, two years ago, preached in an evangelistic rally in Tel Aviv to 2,000 people and had 60 people publicly accept Christ as their Savior. God is obviously up to something unique in Israel. He has brought His people back to the promised land. He set the stage for the time of the end, and He's beginning to move in the hearts and minds of many of the Jewish people. Now, much of what will be fulfilled is yet to come. But the Scripture, I think, is making it clear when you read prophecies about the last days, they always assume Israel will be back in the land in the last days. Well, they're there. That at least gets my attention. Number two, rumors of war in the Middle East. If the Middle East were quiet and peaceful, we might wonder about all those prophecies that the geography is centered in the Middle East. Uh, references to the Euphrates River, uh, to the Valley of Armageddon, uh, to nations like Iran and Libya, etc., all named in Bible prophecy. The geography of the end times prophecies is centered in the crosshairs of the Middle East. Uh, Prophecies like uh, Zechariah 12, Behold, I will make Jerusalem 
a cup of trembling, that is, you can't hold on to it without spilling it, unto all people round about, when they shall be in siege against both Judah and Jerusalem, and in that day. Now, when the prophets use the term that day, they mean that future day. Not this day, their day, back then, 2,500 years ago, but in that day, uh, I will make Jerusalem a burdensome stone, for all people who burden themselves with it shall be cut to pieces. It becomes the irresolvable problem in international affairs. Even though all the people of the earth are gathered against it. Now that's just one of many prophecies that talk about conflict in the Middle East at the time of the end. When Muhammad uh, authorized his followers uh, to use force, if necessary, to spread the message of Islam and the threat of death to keep a convert, uh, and his followers conquered what had been the land of Israel from the Romans and then conquered portions of the old Roman Empire and ultimately took Constantinople, they began to spread their faith led by a different prophet. Now, Muhammad would say, well, Jesus is a prophet of God, but I am the final prophet of God. The Bible is a word from God, but the Quran is the final word from God. Uh, Jesus was a teacher uh, and a prophet, but he really didn't die on the cross. God snatched him up to heaven first. He didn't rise from the dead because he didn't die. And he will come back one day, break all the crosses, denounce Christianity, and affirm the Islamic faith. So you'll occasionally see a billboard that says, come to the mosque, learn about Jesus. He's in the Quran. Yeah, but very differently than how he's in the Bible. Now, the crisis that's going on today has been going on for 1,300 years, since the 7th century. But for much of that time, it was confined either to the Middle East or Europe or parts of Asia Minor. Today, that crisis is worldwide. It's global. We live in a day of jet airplane transportation, uh, instantaneous satellite transmissions, computer technology, and the threat of extremism is on our doorstep constantly, and it is not going to go away. People ask me all the time, when is all this going to come to an end? Probably not till Jesus comes and the Prince of Peace comes uh, to settle this. It's not likely that that's going to happen in the meantime because you have a world religion bent on global conquest. Now, there are many Muslim people that are peaceful. They are not trying to uh, be radicalized. The problem is there are hundreds of thousands who are radical. Uh, that this is not a minor little uh, tip of the iceberg kind of thing. It's huge. And it's global. Go to the website, thereligionofpeace.com. They have cataloged every single terrorist attack since 9-11, 15 years ago, worldwide. They'll tell you the date, when it happened, the location where it happened, and how many people died. Thousands of attacks, and over 100,000 people have died. This is a constant, ongoing problem. The Middle East is in turmoil, and Israel is caught in the crosshairs. Now, as Christians, I think we need to pray, first of all, for the people of Israel, for God's protection and God's direction in their lives. We need to pray for Christian Arab people who live behind the Muslim curtain, who are trapped in persecution. Christianity is now the number one persecuted religion on the planet. And we need to pray for Muslims, that they would see the light of truth, uh, that the God of heaven uh, is a God of love and mercy and grace that you spread your real faith by moral, intellectual, and spiritual persuasion, not by the sword, not by the gun, not by force. If your religion is that uncertain and you're that insecure about it that you have to spread it by force, then there's something about it that is a major problem. And if you ever had religious freedom in the Middle East, which nobody has, I believe half the people would leave that religion immediately because they're held in by fear and intimidation. The ploy of Satan setting the stage 
for the last days. And then I'd look thirdly at the revival of the European Union. You say, well, what's that got to do with Bible prophecy? Well, I think of uh, Daniel chapter 9, uh, verse 26, a verse that tells us uh, that after a certain period of time, the Messiah would come on the scene and be killed or cut off. Uh, and the people of the prince that shall come, the Antichrist, his people will destroy the city and the sanctuary, that's the temple. Well, that was the Romans who did that. When Daniel receives this prophecy, the second temple hadn't even been built yet. Uh, and this is not a prophecy uh, a pious Jew would want to invent out of his head. You want the Messiah to come and be the king. You want the temple to be rebuilt. But that's not what was going to happen. And God had revealed to Daniel, the Messiah will come, Jesus, but he'll be killed. The temple, the sanctuary will be rebuilt and it'll be destroyed. And the city will be destroyed, uh, etc. Uh, the people who did that were the Romans. Now, sometimes people will say, well, they had an army of mercenaries from all over the place. Right, they always had armies of mercenaries wherever they went, but it was the Roman army under a Roman general. And when Titus was successful and destroyed Jerusalem and stole all the stuff out of the temple, where did he take it? To Rome. You can go to Rome today. Look at the Arch of Titus. It's still there 2,000 years later. And on it, the Jewish menorah and all the treasures from the temple, etc., taken by the Roman army. So what does that tell us? The prince that shall come shall come out of the people who did that somehow out of the old Roman Empire, of somewhere out of Europe. I don't think there's any credibility to the idea that the uh, Antichrist is a Muslim uh, or a Jew or certainly not a Christian. You say, well, why do you think that? Because in Daniel 11, it says of the Antichrist, he does not believe in the God of his what? Fathers or any God. He's an atheist and a secularist. He doesn't believe in God at all. And I would remind you, Europe today is a secular society. Read the European Union Constitution. There is not one mention of God in that Constitution, and it's as thick as a gigantic phone book. You say, well, Britain just left. I know that concerns me. Because the British had the only pro-Israel influence in the European Union uh, and America from the outside. And if we keep electing presidents who don't like Israel, uh, that's only going to get worse. And the European Union is going to move further away from Israel and against them in time. But we'll see what happens. At least it gets my attention. Number four, the rise of the global economy. You say, well, now I add, come on, the economy is the economy. What does that have to do with Bible prophecy? Well, I think it has a lot to do with a prophecy that says that the false prophet will cause everyone, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark. The word in Greek is karagma, a tattoo. In their right hand or in their forehead, that nobody might buy or sell, that's the economy, unless he has one of three things, the mark of the beast, the name of the beast, or the number of his name, which has to add up to 300, excuse me, 666. It's not just three sixes. Now again, I've heard every wild speculation uh, over the last 50 years. I remember when people said John Kennedy was the Antichrist. Uh, he was going to form an alliance with the Pope and the Roman Catholic Church would conquer the world. And then he was assassinated and then people said, oh, he's not dead, they froze him. Well, if they thought him out, he'd be a hundred. Uh, I don't think so. Uh, I've heard people say it's Ronald Reagan. Uh, he had six letters in each of his three names, Ronald Wilson Reagan, the Antichrist. Uh, and I've heard people say it was Gorbachev. He had that mark on his forehead, the mark of the beast. Uh, and uh, I've heard people, it's, it's always somebody you didn't vote for, uh, that you don't like, that you want him to be the Antichrist. You know, and I've people say, oh, it's George Bush, and he doesn't know any better. Uh, it's Bill Clinton, and Hillary's the false prophet. Uh, whatever. Those are just wild speculations. Trust me, you don't want to know who the Antichrist is. You figure out who the Antichrist is, you've been left behind. That's for the people that have been left behind to figure out. But, 
If he's got to control a global economy someday, a global economy has to exist. Well, it already does. The clothes you're wearing were made all over the planet. Look at the labels. We're already in a global village. That's already a reality. I mean, in reality, where is your money? You say, well, it's in the bank. No, it's in cyberspace someplace. Uh, go there. If everybody went there on the same day to get it out, you can't. Uh, whatever. Uh, we already have a global economy. So at least it gets my attention. And then number five, reality of weapons of mass destruction. They've already been invented. If we have prophecies in the Bible like Revelation 8, the first angel sounded his trumpet and there followed hail and fire mingled with blood cast upon the earth and a third of the trees were burned up and all of the grass was burned up. You say, well, now that doesn't specifically say nuclear weapons. Obviously not. People in the first century would never have known what that meant. But what else is going to burn up all the grass and a third of the trees? It sure sounds like nuclear war. And when you read Revelation, what do you discover? Armies are marching. Men are fighting. The world is at war. And it starts sounding like nuclear war. The sky is so polluted you can't see the sun or the moon. The water is so polluted you can't drink it. The oceans are polluted, etc. Uh, the vegetation is burning up. It's either cosmic or it's nuclear. Now, I want you to think for a moment of these signs as flashing lights. Let's say that you were going to drive from over here in northern Kentucky back across the Ohio River in through Cincinnati. Uh, and you got into a construction zone. And there are plenty of them over there. Uh, and uh, red lights are flashing. Slow down. Beware. Something's coming up ahead to warn you. These are like flashing red lights in Bible prophecy. Israel is back in the land. Are they there? Tell me. Yes or no? Yes. Is there a crisis going on in the Middle East? Yes. Uh, are we in a time when people are trying to revive the old Roman Empire in Europe? Yes. Has the global economy already been invented? Yes. Have weapons of mass destruction already been invented? Yes. I mean, how many things have to happen till God gets our attention? If there were no weapons of mass destruction, and there are about 20,000 or more on the planet, it only takes four or five to blow up the planet. I don't want to ruin your dinner. Uh, but be that as it may, we're sitting on a bomb every day. Then let me give you two more. Number six, the revolt of apostasy that is going on in our time. I don't like to pick on people by name, but Rob Bell picked on himself, uh, who said uh, in his book, Love Wins, uh, that hell is not real. Uh, pastored an evangelical church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. But hell is really just your mind saying no to God, and you end up on the trash heap of life. And because the Bible uh, uses, uh, even in Jesus' words, the term Gehenna, uh, that hell is like Gehenna, like the fires in the trash pit, Rob concluded, hell's nothing but a trash pit. Uh, it has nothing to do with a place of eternal punishment and torment. You see, if creation is not literal, hell is not literal. And then what? Heaven is not literal. A and the gospel is not that decisive. So in his book, Love Wins, Rob says, oh, ultimately everybody goes to heaven. Uh, Muslims, Hindus, Buddhists, Baptists, everybody. Because uh, Jesus is in the process of saving everybody, whether they know it or not. Now, there's a term for this. In fact, we've got an article about it in the Apologetics Encyclopedia. You call it what? Universalism. That everybody in the universe will ultimately be saved. Everybody will go to heaven. doesn't matter if they believe in Jesus or not. Uh, because Jesus died to save everybody, so therefore everybody gets to go to heaven, etc., etc. That's just, again, the tip of the iceberg. Uh, some of you that are older keep asking yourself, what is happening in so many of these churches today? They don't take Genesis literally. They don't take the second coming literally. And they've got a kind of anybody come and no matter what, Jesus loves you. And there's a message of love, but there's never a message of ju judgment. 
There's never a message of a call to repentance. There's never even a clear-cut message of a call to faith. There's an assumption that, well, God's a nice guy and everybody gets in. I remind you, not everybody got in the ark. Uh, There were only eight people that were saved in the ark. And that apostasy is spreading like wildfire. Now, it's been around a long time. Uh, At the end of the 18th century, there were people already questioning the Bible. By the 19th century, there were lots of people doing that. And by the early 20th century, the mainline churches had gone so liberal, they denied the virgin birth of Christ, the deity of Christ, the blood atonement, the literal resurrection, and any kind of a literal second coming. That's why conservative, Bible-believing Christians rallied together to say, we need to hold on to what? The fundamentals of the faith. Uh, Those things are essential. You can disagree if you want on your mode of baptism or church government, but good night. Uh, If Jesus is not the Son of God and He didn't die for our sins, why are we here? And the liberal churches went into total decline in the 20th century. They're still declining and shrinking numerically every single day that passes. Because if you don't believe anything, my father, who was a truck driver with an eighth grade education, who didn't know the difference between God and a goat, uh, who got saved late in life, if he'd ever stumbled into one of those churches, you would not have held his attention for three weeks. He'd have been out of there. They don't believe the Bible's true, uh, Alan. I don't believe uh, uh, that Jesus is real or that He rose from the dead. So what are we wasting our time here? Let's go bowling. Uh, We're gone. And conservative evangelical churches grew by leaps and bounds, preaching the Bible, standing up for the gospel, proclaiming an evangelistic message. And at the beginning of the 20th century, the liberal churches had all the buildings, they had all the money, they had all the schools, they had all the programs. And by the end of the 20th century, fundamental evangelical people had all the money, all the schools, all the buildings, all the programs, and all the multimedia, uh, and all the cool singing groups, and all the Christian TV and radio stations. And all of a sudden, those churches started saying, well, maybe we shouldn't take the Bible so seriously. Maybe we shouldn't take it so literally. Uh, Maybe God's not that serious uh, that you've got to believe all this stuff in order to go to heaven. And the tactic of Satan is undermine the evangelical movement, and if you can do that, nothing's left. That's why, number seven, the country's in chaos. Uh, my verse on apostasy, 2 Thessalonians 2, 3. Let nobody deceive you by any means, except there come a falling away first, that apostasia, a departure from the truth, then all these other things will not occur. Well, the apostasy is already here. It's already ruined Europe and European Christianity. It ruined most of Northeastern America, and it's in the process of ruining the rest of the country. We're not being shelled offshore by the British. We're being shelled onshore by Satan. And his target is to get the church not to take the Bible seriously. And once you abandon creation, and you abandon the blood atonement, and you abandon a literal resurrection, you have lost the gospel, you have lost the power of Christianity to transform the life of an individual. Number seven, the ruin of society that we are now observing on television almost nightly. Our nation is more and more in chaos. We are a deeply divided society. Secular education has convinced people there really is no God. Relativism has convinced them there really is no truth. All that leaves you with is selfism and materialism to try to get stuff to make yourself happy and your stuff will never love you back and it'll never get the job done and finally people lapse into mysticism. Well, if the Bible's not true, if God really isn't out there, who is? Maybe the devil is. Maybe zombies are real. Ah, yeah, that'd be good. Maybe there's an alternate universe of some kind or an alternate reality. 
and when the public educational system in this country threw God and the Bible out of the schools, it threw God and the Bible out of the lives of people. And it's taken 50 years for all of that to filter down to the street, and that's where we are today. Francis Schaeffer, the great Christian apologist and theologian, predicted all of this over 40 years ago, that this is where America would end up ultimately without God, that all you have left are the fumes of Christianity in society. And he said all that's left ultimately are the symbols, the crosses, the Ten Commandments, and those will eventually go. And when that's gone, it's all gone, except for those who believe the Word of God, stand for the Word of God, stand for the truth, and have the gall, the vision, the faith, the guts to build a life-size ark. Ah, uh, like right in your face. That's what the Bible's all about. Now, the boat's not going to save them, but the boat is going to make them think. It's going to make them realize this is huge. Uh, right. You had to get a lot of animals in there. That's the whole point of the whole thing. Now I'll let Ken talk about that. But all of that is vital. Why? Because when our culture walks away from God, we've got to hold up the truth stronger than ever before. The last verse, Matthew 24, 37. What did Jesus say? The days before my second coming will be as it was in the days of Noah. When they're eating and drinking, indulging in life, marrying and giving in marriage, and knew not, judgment was coming. Are we on the edge of the last days? Is a trumpet about to sound, the archangel about to shout? Seven flashing lights, prophetically, that I think need to get our attention more severely than ever before. Jesus is coming again. Now, I want you to help me with the sermon. Turn to the people around you at your table, look them right in the face, whether you know them or not, and say, Jesus really is coming again. The clock is ticking. <laughs> then I want you to ask him a question. Look right back at him and ask this question. Is he coming again? for you. This has been Seven Signs the Rapture's Close, presented by Ed Heinson. To receive a free catalog of hundreds of awesome Bible studies on DVD video and audio CD, all using and defending a literal translation of the Bible, information on upcoming Bible conferences in your area, or details of our missionary outreach and trips to Israel, Call Compass at 800-977-2177 24 hours a day or visit us on the web at compass.org. And be sure to like us on Facebook. Search facebook.com slash compassbible.